Okay, we have arrived at the Magic Hour. It is 9.30 a.m., and I'd like to call the regular board meeting for Tampa Bay Water to order. And next order of business will be uh, to do the Pledge of Allegiance by my Vice Chair, uh, Commissioner Day Beggars. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning again, and I do want to thank you all for coming. Um, we are, have now officially opened our, our board meeting today, and we'll go right into public comment. Um, our first speaker will be Mark Clutho. Mark Lutho Largo. Well, here's this neat little information from the water bill. The method treatment will be temporarily changed from chloramine to chlorine disinfection to optimize water quality. Well, you know what that tells me. What you're doing isn't right. Yeah, it's bogus. Uh, typical here. Agenda. Desalination plant expansion feasibility study. When do you run it at 25 million gallons a day? You people are a joke. And here's any energy management program. Look at the lighting system here. What kind of energy management do you do? And vulnerability assessment security improvements? Oh, what a joke. And the regional water, regional water supplies and member man, uh, demands year-end summary. I remember you crying, oh, we couldn't sell our water because of BP. We have to sue them for money. Oh, ho, 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 ho. You people are disgusting. I see all the boys are wearing their coats. Yeah, you should probably go see a doctor. Sickos. Here's the headline. Last month, climate panel foresees big trouble as Earth warms. Earth is in more hot water than ever before, and so are we, an expert. United Nations Climate panel warned in a grim new report Wednesday. You fools don't know what's going to hit you. It's so sad. Just so sad. It is alarming to read such a thorough cataloging of all the serious changes in the planet said a Texas A&M University climate scientist. Wow, coming from Texas A&M? Holy cow. What's particularly disturbing as a scientist is that virtually all of these changes were predicted years or decades ago. I'm sorry, your time's up. Thank you. Oh. Next Your speaker. time is way past due. Thank you. David Ballard Geddes, next speaker. Good morning. Uh, David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. In order to maintain a proper pH balance in a swimming pool, a constant dose of chlorine is required. Absent chlorine, a swimming pool will become rancid 
within a matter of days. Now imagine using your swimming pool as a toilet, as a traditional means, as a customary way of disposing of your feces, and you invite your friends over for a party, making the claim that the pool automatically filters and legally chlorinates the water to a standard claimed as highly treated. Jumping in with both feet is the capital interests of both the Democratic and Republican Party pooling their money constitutionally in way over their heads. And I feel some people in this room are questioning not just my logic, but the reasoning of my sanity, I feel, is in question, same as I question the reclaim water as not being sanitary or sterilized. In fact, statute 70.001 claims reclaimed water to be noxious. In fact, directly injecting temporarily chlorinated feces directly into the aquifer, injecting reclaimed water fecal nitrates directly into our vital drinking water supply, connecting our wastewater directly with our drinking water supply, injecting temporarily treated reclaimed water directly into our aquifer is not and never will be a best use practice of disposing of our gray water way in over their heads. The reasoning of our legislation logically is not sane. Having no further excuse, legislation in a long-standing act of belligerence bordering on blasphemy is laying waste to, is contaminating our vital water supply, is and has been engaged in acts of actual warfare treasonously against the inhabitants to this land using water as its weapon of choice. Beyond a reasonable doubt, it is self-evident water as a power of the earth. Water as declared is being used constitutionally as a tool of warfare as based on the 14th Amendment and the legislative body as a whole in and of this government. The body of government itself shall be faced on charges constitutionally on, in, and of this matter. Thank you. Thank you, and that concludes the speakers that have signed up uh, for public comments or anyone else wishing to make a comment during this time. Okay, seeing them, we will close public comment. And um, I would like to uh, just take a moment before we move into the agenda um, to talk about Imagine a Day Without Water, uh, which is Wednesday, October 23rd, this coming Wednesday. In a moment, um, I'd like to ask my fellow board members to join me in making um, and accepting the proclamation in recognition of this day. Imagine a Day Without Water began in 2015 as a project of the U.S. Water Alliance's Value Water Campaign. Today, more than 1,000 organizations participate in this annual day of advocacy and education. And to recognize the critical importance of access to reliable, clean, safe water and the need to maintain our water infrastructure, Tampa Bay Water is participating in Imagine a Day Without Water social media campaign, including a video staff would like to play for us this morning. The video encourages people to simply think about water because it's something we tend to take for granted, yet it touches all parts of life. And actually, I have to interject my personal feelings, water is the essence of life. The more we think about water, the more likely we are to conserve, protect it, and can recognize it as an essential resource. And with that, I'd like to ask staff to play the video. It is powerful, it is calm, it is adventure and relaxation, it is happiness, it is sadness, it's energy and bravery, it's mysterious and unforgiving, it is hard work and then relief, it's health and beauty, it is pure and it's as old as time, and the region depends on it. It's water. Think about it.
Great, thank you. Um, in recognition that water is essential to our quality of life and economic prosperity, I will now read the proclamation showcasing Tampa Bay Water's dedication to providing a reliable supply of clean, safe water to the Tampa Bay region now and for future generations. The proclamation reads, imagine a day without water. Recognizing the annual National Day of Advocacy, Imagine a Day Without Water, being held on October 23, 2019, which is an organized effort to educate the public about why water is an essential and valuable resource, highlighting the critical importance of access to reliable, clean water and the need for water infrastructure investments necessary to maintain and rebuild these vital systems. Whereas the regional infrastructure that brings more than 2.5 million residents an average of 181 million gallons of water per day is essential to the quality of life, environment, and economic vitality of the Tampa Bay region. And whereas a day without water would be a public health and safety crisis due to the impacts which would limit the abilities of safety personnel, such as firefighters and hospital staff, to do their jobs, as well as businesses and homes to function. Whereas living without water is an economic crisis, considering a single nationwide day without water surface would put billions in economic activity at risk. Whereas our water infrastructure supports every facet of our daily lives and faces unique challenges. Whereas these challenges look different to different communities will require local solutions, but it's clear that reinvestment in our water systems must now be a national priority. Therefore, Tampa Bay Water proclaims water is essential to the quality of life and economic prosperity and acknowledges the importance of educating the public about the value of water through the Imagine a Day Without Water campaign. And further, Tampa Bay Water proclaims its dedication to investing in clean, safe, and reliable water infrastructure, calls on our federal and state partners to bring much needed funding and innovation to protect our critical water infrastructure. And that is the uh, proclamation. And if there are no objections, I'd like to accept this proclamation into the record. Seeing no objection, uh, we will do that. Is there any comment? It's a really important thing to do. So we will now go with the agenda. And Mr. Jordan, would you like to introduce the consent agenda? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we do have the consent agenda for your consideration. And unless there are any questions, I would ask for uh, consideration for approval. Move okay. approval. We have a motion to approve. Second. And a second. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda? Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Like, sign, opposed, show that passed. And we will now move to the regular agenda. Uh, yes, ma'am, and I'll uh, give my report. Um, there was no executive uh, committee meeting in September, so nothing to report there. Um, <clears throat> I would like to just uh, remind the board that uh, we've been working, or uh, the district is, the Southwest Florida Water Management District is planning on having a workshop about discuss water supply uh, um, projects and initiatives. Uh, originally scheduled for this month, it's my understanding, that's now scheduled for December the 10th. I do not have a precise time right now, but we will continue to keep the board informed in that regard. Um, <clears throat> The other item I'd like to discuss this morning with the board is at the last meeting, uh, you asked me to, uh, in, as we were, just, the board was discussing, discussing the potential for board workshops, facilitated workshops. <clears throat> I was asked to look uh, at our staff to see if we had any trained facilitators that could facilitate at this level, and uh, really we, we do not. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we do have a list of facilitators that we, I think, pr previously provided to the board. Uh, depending on the board's pleasure, we would certainly be happy to uh, reach out to some of those to, to do some further investigations, maybe even secure some quotes. But I just offer that as a response to the direction the board gave me at the last uh, meeting in, uh, in August. And happy to take any direction or discussion. Okay, so what are you recommending? Well, you know, obviously, uh, I think, you know, occasionally it's good to have uh, 
a retreat or a workshop, you know, certainly maybe annually, just to discuss goals and priorities. And certainly, if the board is looking at, you know, particular matters or things that they'd like to work through and have some additional discussions that would call for a facilitated workshop, then I would certainly recommend those. So that, those are my thoughts. Uh, I think discussions and having conversations are certainly good things. It really just comes down to the board's, you know, the, the timing of this and when the board may feel this would be appropriate. Okay. Any comments? Mr. Eggers? Um, well, <clears throat> I, I thought the, uh, the idea behind these uh, potential workshops were to have some, um, just some good conversation uh, amongst board members, whether it would be about water supply or you know, water quality or um, the, the use of reclaimed water as a water source in the long run. Um, and so, for, from my perspective, if if the board thinks we can do it at a at a board meeting, I guess that's fine. But again, we, we've had a we've had a, a rocky couple of years, and I think it's nice that we can have some of these conversations um, when we're not having issues to vote on. And I think that's that was the idea behind, from my perspective, to have workshops. Um, and to have dialogue uh, under good good conditions. So anyway, that, that I think it is a good idea to have it, and and I would certainly like to look into that. Um, I do agree with your comments. I'd like to see it more in a uh, board workshop or board slash retreat type mode, where it's um, not a part of our board business. It's a separate Agreed. part of the agenda. Uh, maybe we can have a board meeting where the agenda is somewhat abbreviated um, and then move, uh, you know, go through lunch like 11 to 2 type thing uh, where we can um, really just get into an open discussion. I agree. Uh, um, and, and are you envisioning uh, changing the the... the where we're like not doing it up on the dais, but I, I don't want to do it up here. I agree. With that I'd as rather well. it be in a more comfortable setting. Um, I don't even know if there's something off site we can go to that um, I think all I think part of what we will ask today is ask staff to consider maybe something off site. I'm fine. I definitely don't want it on the dais. Right. Yep. I agree um, with you. Okay. Yes, Councilwoman Rice. Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree with Councilmember Egger's comments. I think that exactly the big issues of water supply and water quality that are our biggest responsibilities really warrant the opportunity for further like workshop discussion, especially even with uh, Exhibit D. Uh, I realize we're going to have some time today in our meeting to discuss it, and I don't want to jump ahead, but. It seems to me that that's a big issue that certainly warrants a workshop. And not that there's conflict, but it just, um, it's a big issue. And there's a lot to suss out. And, and uh, the, in getting back to a facilitator would not be a staff person. It, uh, as recommended by the, our general manager is that he feels like someone from the outside would better be better to facilitate those discussions. Yes, Michelle? I also agree with the workshop idea, not at the dais, somewhere mm -hmm. else be fine. But I was wondering about the facilitator that would fit the needs of the type of workshop we're going to have. In other words, it's not necessarily specific to one item, but it'd be broader. So if there's one of those facilitators that would, you know, okay. kind of match up with that, that would Kind of okay. leave things open. You talk about mm -hmm. everything rather than just one. A facilitator think, who knows water. How about that? Uh, I mean, definitely. Yeah, mainly water, yeah. So we have another meeting in December. Um, uh, I was thinking to do this start in January um, because it's kind of an off month for us. Um, it's usually executive meeting. And instead of the executive meeting, unless there's pressing business, we could uh, do this. Um, so let's... Um, Let's have staff come back to us um, in December with an agenda, the facilitator, place, all the details, and then we'll move forward. Perfect. Yeah. Does that sound good? Yep. Comments? Okay. Chair? Uh, quick, yes, quick Councilman question. Rice. Um, at this point, it looks like we're being requested for um, 
a board decision in December about Exhibit D. So if it's possible, if there's flexibility in the timeline so that we could have a workshop before a vote is required. Um, we will have an exec executive committee meeting in November. Yes, ma'am. We can, um, okay. if, if we feel that that's necessary, we can delay that till February. Is that okay with everybody? Okay, so you've got your marching order. So the direction is to look at November executive committee. No. Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Uh, we do the board workshop in January. Um, I in December, um, you would bring to us all the details: who, what, when, where, why. Um, and then in at our executive meeting, um, we can discuss uh, D. And then if we feel like we need to defer it until after this board workshop, we could do it at that time. Is that agreeable? I'm looking at executive committee members. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. And uh, just to point out, and this is typically what we do every year in January, typically the executive committee meeting is the third Monday. Mm -hmm. And because of the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, we have it the fourth Monday in January. So uh, that would be the 27th. As I understand. Of January. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Just so you. Jan yeah. January 27th, everybody. No Super Bowl, no, nothing on Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're good. Okay. Would you like to continue? Uh, that is what I have, unless you want to go to the next. Um, you have, um, well, we have under, under your report. Of what yes, the technology I'll purchase? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask Michelle Stom to uh, give an overview or presentation uh, on a proposal for Granicus Government Meeting Technology Software. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm Michelle Stom, your Chief Communications Office Officer. Um, there is no presentation today, but item G2 is requesting board approval to purchase a new government meeting software, Granicus. During discussion at your June budget hearing, the board asked um, us to look into ways of improving the way we deliver minutes and live stream board meetings. And we've also, as staff, been looking at ways to um, improve and make efficient our agenda process that we've been using for about 20 years. Our research led us to the Granicus government meeting technology. This program will help us improve the agenda and live streaming processes and improve the efficiency and effectiveness of board meeting minutes and more. Some of our member governments, as well as many Florida agencies, um, are using this technology, and we'll be implementing it through a phased approach. So we'll start with our internal agenda process, and we'll end with meeting management and electronic voting for the board. The contract does include full training for both staff and the board members. With that, staff recommends approval to purchase a one-year Granicus technology package in the amount of $38,349. Subsequent year renewals will be approved as part of the annual budgeting process. Seems very inexpensive. Move we get a lot for the second. Get a lot for what we're paying. So we do have a motion. Who made the motion? Oh, okay, Commissioner Smith, second by Councilwoman uh, Rice um, and Commissioner Oakley. All in favor, say aye. 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 Mike, sign the post. Show that passed. <clears throat> the. Hey. Um, the next item under, under general manager's report is item G3, which is the 2000, uh, 2020 uh, legislative goals uh, and grant funding priorities. And uh, Mr. Peter Dunbar and Matthew Blair will be making uh, those presentations. Uh, Madam Chairman, members, uh, I will do this very briefly. Uh, the legislature goes early this year. First day of session will be January the 14th. Um, today begins the third week of interim committees, and their activities this week are primarily in the Senate focused on uh, the proceedings re regarding the removal and restatement of the Broward County Sheriff's uh, Sheriff and uh, no activity with regard to legislation. You do have a report, our initial report, um, on the bills that have been filed. So far, as of Friday of last week, there are only about 500 pieces of legislation uh, formally filed. Um, there's not anything of particular significance to Tampa Bay Water formally in the system yet, and it represents about 20% of what ultimately will be filed between now and the first day of the legislative session. 
I believe you have there for approval the standard um, uh, instructions to us as we have in prior years, um, with one exception. We have had an outreach from um, uh, Senator Simpson, and we are expecting that there will be a major reuse, water reuse package uh, that's being developed. It has not been released yet, and no meetings have been uh, uh, specifically scheduled yet. Uh, with those thoughts in mind, I do know that there are some items that are being recommended for appropriations, and I would ask Matt Blair if he'd come up and identify those. Right, so we have two uh, recommendations from uh, your staff relative to seeking funding approval from the state, and that would be a Starkey Wellfield improvement and also uh, Cypress Bridge Wellfield improvements. And so we're working through the appropriations process. Those forms and those bills are filed in the House by the 15th of November. Uh, we've secured sponsors, Representative Grant in the House, and Senator Hooper in the Senate are willing to sponsor and support uh, the Tampa Bay water requests. Uh, and so that is the appropriations update. It's gonna be a narrow a budget year this year. Uh, the governor is asking for significant increase relative to teacher pay and funding there, a number of other items. And the, frankly, the, uh, the budget, uh, the, the revenue expectations are more narrow than they were last session. So that sets up an interesting set of dynamics on the appropriations front. Nevertheless, we will pursue that uh, on those two projects this year. And Madam Chairman, if there are no questions, that's our report this morning. I have a question. Members? Yes, Commissioner Smith. Um, on number th 3A um, of uh, the legislative goals and, and priorities, the first sentence is uh, at the federal level to monitor potential amendments to the Clean Water Safety Act, in cur including current legislation that could roll back broad sweeping powers in rulemaking at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Can you tell me what's intended there? Because the wording sounds like we're, uh, we support deregulation. My concern is, you know, not to, that they might roll back broad sweeping powers, but that they might actually uh, roll back the rules that protect water quality, as is currently happening. Yes, and, and I would look to our federal uh, representative there, and I'll gather that additional specific information for you um, from our Washington consultant, because I want to be very specific in our response to you relative to that. I can tell you that, uh, generally speaking, this is comfort language that we've advocated for in Washington for a number of years. And so this would not represent any change in our status as an agency at all in that regard. The goal is not to roll back clean water regulation at all. That would not be in the interest of Tampa Bay water and would not be part of our focus at all. That's what I figured. Um, so, so I just wonder if we might uh, rewrite that just um, instead of saying um, that, that we're going to monitor and uh, including current legislation that could roll back broad sweeping powers in the rulemaking, that we say we're going to monitor potential amendments to the Clean Water Safety Act and any legislation that could weaken protections of water quality. Just keep it uh, simple, vague, but not sound with that kind of language about broad sweeping powers being a concern, but rather uh, legislation that could weaken protections of water quality. That certainly sounds consistent with what has been historically mm -hmm. the position of uh, Tampa Bay Water and would remain the position of Tampa Bay Water on that issue. Thanks. Did our federal partners write this paragraph? Uh, yes, they did. Okay, so that's where it started from. Yeah. So maybe you could have them talk to Commissioner Smith, and uh, I think a phone call yes. would be better than just gathering information uh, so she can discuss. Because I, I, we've seen this every year, um, and uh, I think the word could is always the word that satisfies me, but I understand what you're saying. You don't want it to say could roll back. Um, so... Uh, let's just have them talk to her, and then we'll go forward. Sounds great. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. 
uh, Councilman Moran. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. If I may ask the two gentlemen on uh, G3, I'd like to just a little further uh, opportunity to explain uh, the firing items under uh, government support number one, under that uh, three, uh, 2B and 4A. Um, Councilman, I do. We don't have. Oh, all right. So well, if you could uh, direct the question. Yeah, they. Uh, yeah. What it is is um, on um, number one, government support, uh, governance before, uh, support for legislation that is consistent with and opposed legislation that is inconsistent with, and amended the reinstated local inter interlocal agreement and the current provisions of section seventy three point seven one three and seventy three. Point seven one five Florida statute, which relates to the organizational powers, duties, regional water supply authority generally, and Tampa Bay water specifically. We're going from something generally to something specific, and uh, it's like I, I'm—I I mean, I'm going to tell the legislature on something generally that I don't know what you're talking about, and water specifically, I may understand. Specifically, uh, under the terms of the organization, under Chapter three seventy three and the written interlocal agreement, actions by the legislature that would change what the member governments had agreed on triggers an element that would allow for the unraveling of the agency. The language that you're reading from has been standard operating procedure for us for decades so that we are always stepping forward when something of a general nature on water, water resources, water reuse, whatever that might be, could impair Tampa Bay water on all prior occasions when you point out that if you make this change, it affects the interlocal agreement, uh, they've been more than willing to defer, and that's really what's expressed there, is for us to be able to explain to members of the legislature, if you do it this way, you may impact the agency's interlocal agreement. Well, then my other question to myself is, and I'll explain it in a minute, is that we have a contract or an agreement that ends in 2038. Am I correct? No, I, well, it has judging two endings. on the general counsel, I would agree with that. Yeah, it has two endings, and I'll be more specific, general right. counsel, sir. How can you have two endings on a contract, one that says it ends on 2038, and then there's a pause, and it says, unless there's debt? When you get a divorce and you pay all your child alimony, it ends. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just a regular guy. I'm just a regular Joe who was lucky enough to get elected, I guess. I'll, I'll defer to the general counsel on this one. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And that's what I'm talking about, well, generally specific. Um, I can address that for you, um, members of the board. The way the interlocal agreement is currently written, um, it does have a termina termination date of um, 2038. So it was designed to last for 40 years unless the agency um, issues bonds whose payback date extends beyond 2038. In that case, the interlocal agreement would extend until those bonds are paid back. Currently, the agency does not have any bonds whose payback date um, extends beyond 2038. So if the agency were to issue bonds whose you know, payback period would extend beyond 2038, the agency would at that time be making a commitment to extend the interlocal agreement beyond 2038. Thus far, that has not happened. Thank you, but I'm sure it will happen. I'm not saying I'm sure, but it more likely probably be, it will happen. And the reason I bring this up is that we just passed 2.9 billion in infrastructure for the city of Tampa for aging water pipes and tertiary treatment lines that, that need to be repaid they haven't done for 100 years or so. And what we did, and I'm not saying that we should do what Tampa does, is that we pay 53% and only bond 47%. What does that do? First of all, it enhances everybody to be a participant in the beginning, and you get more productivity out of your money because you don't have to pay the interest on it. It's front-loaded. So what we do in government, and I've, I've been saying this to the city for years, you cannot continue to get in debt. People that have no debt cannot go broke. It's impossible. People that have debt will go broke. And governments have gone broke because they're in debt. Not only governments, nations have gone broke because they're in debt. So I'm trying to avoid something that, in my little mind from the housing project, tells me, hey, don't buy it unless you pay for it. 
So I have that phobia about being in debt. And it applies to me that if we go in a sensible way and do something in the beginning instead of at the end, you get more for your dollar and you're not in debt. Therefore, you can't go broke. So instead of looking at it opposing something like this, maybe the legislature can change something that says that you can pay for something, but you can only half fund it. So you have to go to the taxpayers and tell them what you're doing as elected officials and why you're doing it. And then take it, whether you get elected or not, that's up to the public. But I know of no one that's gotten unelected when they say the truth to the public. And what I'm saying is the model, I'm not saying to copy Tampa's model. I'm saying to do a model that we talk about meeting with this person and that person paying somebody to tell us what it is when they themselves have never done it. To have something in place that these nine members, that honorable members that we serve here, can say, you know what, I've changed something for the better of all of us. And that is not to get in debt 100%. To get in debt and charge a little bit more for the rate, but put it aside for whatever you're going to do until you get enough money to start the project and fund it with that rate until it's halfway or more completed. And that's the only way you won't go broke. Good thoughts. Really, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I mean, this is a classic example of people that go into debt and they get that one credit card that has zero interest so that they can get out of debt. Meanwhile, they have another credit card and they're still racking up debt. So I, I have always been concerned about the debt in this agency. And that is no secret to anybody on this board. We're over a billion dollars in debt. And um, I don't know where it stops, but our debt should not allow the agreement to automatically go past its deadline. And I'm glad he brought up that point. And uh, I'm just trying to bring something up that's yeah. different. You can't continue to deal. If I dealt the way I did 50 years ago, I'd still be where I was at 50 years ago. You have to change. You have to comb your hair differently like yourself. You look very distinguish and and you have to do things in a mannerism that helps the public but makes them a part of it in the beginning and tell them exactly what you're going to do how you're going to do it and how you're going to pay for it and i think they'll buy into it i think uh mr dunbar mentioned to me standing there while you were speaking uh it might be uh informative for you all that on the funding request that the board is making uh, you're making a 50% request of the state to participate in both of those projects. And so as you talk about making sure that there's an investment and, and that uh, you're not bearing the full cost of that, that's exactly what staff has tried to do and tried to advocate for, whether it's funding coming from uh, the Water Management District as appropriate or whether it's funding coming from the state legislature seeking, seeking dollars to be able to, to buy down that cost for the user. I'm glad you brought that up, and I'm not debating anyone, but when you brought that up about the funding with the Management District, when all the nine of us took an oath of office, you know, whatever government we serve in, then we sit here and we're doing something, in my opinion, when you look at the funding mechanism now, all the governments before could ask directly to the specific wherever agency you belong to, whether it's this one in Brooksville, anyone else in the, in, the, in the state, where you would apply and certainly have a lot of demand for their money. I understand that, and certainly they qualify them. But now that changed through a policy. You cannot, an entity or a city or a county government, cannot directly ask our agency, which is in Brooksville. I'm not going to mention by name, so they say I'm not critical. And then you do that and you get rejected. You have to come to this agency for them to approve for you to go to Brooksville to get something done. In my opinion, I'm not a lawyer, and don't possess to be one. How can you pay taxes to any one of those and you gotta go to somebody else to get approval when the money goes to them and it's their right to dispense it the way they see it and we have to do that? I find that to be absurd. Thank you. Thank you. Um, further comments? <laughs> Mr. Eggers? Um, I, I'm just really, you know, council member, I, I just, I really appreciate your perspectives. I, I, I don't know really what to say. Um, I'm not a debt guy either. Um, 
I don't like debt, but I do understand that debt has a has a has a cost. And right now, debt co debt cost is probably at its all time low. I won't say all time; that, that somebody will come back and tell me differently. But there is a time and a place. We do a lot of paying paying as we go. Our, we have a, a very vital capital program that we invest in um, annually, and so the the so as we, it, if the issue is, uh, do you want to Stay in an agreement beyond 2038. Um, that's that's a whole different discussion. But there will be there will be opportunities in the next 10 years. I would imagine that there will be some the possibility of large capital expenditures that can't pay as you go, and that with the low interest rates that they're there, we're just going to pay it over time, and that might extend beyond that 2038. So when we have that discussion at that time, I think that. It's more appropriate. I'm not really sure where we're going with all of the conversation this morning. I just know that debt has a role, um, and right now, its, it's cost of debt is it couldn't be couldn't be lower. Uh, and and I would say to your point, we do a lot of sharing with SwiftMud on costs, and we also uh, do a lot of our own payments during the, during the course of our budget on capital. So I think this organization has been, just keep in mind, again, people always forget that the number of water sources that we have developed over time is unbelievable. So it took a lot of debt to get there. And I think the structure of that is gonna start dropping in the late 20s, 2025, I think, the first part, and then comes in for a, a landing in 2038. So I think it was designed to be able to afford reasonably what we've done. So I'm not going to be critical and I'm not going to uh, be afraid of debt. So, um, but in any event, uh, I think those kind of conversations are part of the discussions we might have in our workshops down the road. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? And uh, 4A. Oh, oh, oh yeah. have you finished with it? Am I, am I ahead of the game? And no, no. Yes, sir, yes. Uh, I, I want to make sure of that. Uh, in 4A, the support legislation that affects regarding the definition of reclaimed water and reuse advocate consistently with the amended and restated interlocal agreement and current provision of the same section I mentioned before. So when I read that, and I made some notes here, I, I, it, so I'm going to tell somebody, whatever agency it is, whatever city it is, maybe they're not in any, they're just doing their own little thing, that in order for them to use reclaimed water, they got to come somewhere to do it. And get approval when they, if they have the technology and the money to do it, they should do it to save the environment, to produce the cheapest water that there is now, aside from you know, water from uh, the aquifer straight up, is water that hasn't been used yet. Cheapest because it helps the environment, it helps the supply, and it's a very lasting supply, and that's reclaimed water. I know the public, oh, reclaimed water. You know what that is? And I'll tell them, yeah, the cows take a shit in the river, and the oil goes in the river, and everything else goes through the river, and I got to give you river water, and you love it. Here we go. <laughs> I hate to be direct, but that's how I am. So everybody loves it. But when you talk about reclaim, oh, we can't use that. The desal plant, you have red tide, you have bacteria, you have got whales that are dying, but that's fine. And I'm not being critical, don't get me wrong. So the problem is that we don't face things one-on-one -on -one directly. We go around and, hey, hey, you know what I'm doing? Give me the ball. They're either going to hit it or I'm going to get them out. One of the two. That's how it is. But I understand. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are you finished with your list? I'm finished. Okay. Um, thank you all very much. <clears throat> and Madam Chair. Um, and do we need to, we need to approve the... Yes, Legislative and grant funding goals and priorities. That is do, I have request. A, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. I have second. a motion second. and a second to approve the uh, legislative and grant funding goals and priorities for 2020. 2020. That sounds so strange. Um, all in favor say aye. No, aye. aye. I'd like, sign, oppose. Show that aye. hearing. Okay. We have no general counsel report today, correct? Okay, and then, um, so Mr. Jordan will move to the water production. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Mary Bell, Mary Bell Medina is going to provide the board uh, with an update, update regarding the uh, desalination facility. 
Well, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, in August we provide, 2018, we provided an update regarding the desalination facility and Tampa Electrics, or TICO's, Big Bend Power Plant Modernization Project. Today, we are updating you with the findings of an evaluation completed by our consultant, Black & Beach, on the impacts of the TICO project to our desalination facility <laughs> operations and the steps staff are taking to address these findings. This is an information agenda item only, and no action from the board will be requested today. This graphic shows the relationship between Tico's Big Bend power plant and the desalination facility. One of the benefits of co-locating with the power plant is that we use seawater from the cooling water tunnels at the power plant to supply our desalination plant and to dilute and mix the leftover salty concentrate from the desalination facility after drinking water is produced. However, since we are co-located with the Big Bend power plant, any changes at the power station operations could affect the operations of the desalination facility. The red box highlights the area where this occurs. The Big Bend power plant has currently four power generation units. All units discharge cooling water from the units to their respective tunnels. At the conclusion of TICO's project in 2023, three power generation units will remain active. Unit 1 will be the base load unit, operating nearly 100% of the time. Unit 3 will be used as needed. Unit 4 will be a base load unit, operating about 80% of the time. In the graphic, and the graphic here shows the supply of seawater to the desalination facility from units three and four with the purple line. Note that we are not connected to unit or tunnel one for water supply. The concentrate disposal from the desalination facility is shown with the blue dotted line. There are three areas critical to the desalination facility operations that will likely be impacted by the TICO project. The first one is the expected lowered seawater supply temperature. It is anticipated that the new Unit 1 in TICO's Big Bend power plant will result in a lower average cooling water temperature on the discharge side of the TICO tunnels. The good news is that that impacts the, that impacts to the desalination facility reverse osmosis water treatment process by a lower, lower water temperature are anticipated to be minimal. The second area impacted is the seawater supply quantity and reliability. Currently, we have a 99% reliable source of seawater from our connections to units three and four, cooling water tunnels, which are now TICO's base load units. The good news is that during TICO's construction, we will continue to have a 99% reliable source of seawater from units three and four. At the conclusion of the project, TICO plans to rely mostly on unit one as a base load unit and reduce the use of units three and four, resulting in an 85% reliable source of seawater supply starting in January 2023. What this means is that sometimes there will be less water supply from units three and four. Later in the presentation, I will discuss how we're planning to address this change condition. The final area impacted by the TICO project is the concentrate disposal reliability. We rely on cooling water from the TICO tunnels to provide the required dilution to the concentrate discharge per our National Pollution Discharge Elimination System or NPDES permit requirements. Currently, we have a 99% reliable flow of cooling water to provide the permits required dilution. Once TICO, TICO's project is complete, that reliability will be reduced and varies depending on the water production at the desalination plant. The good news is that our, at our current production rates of up to 16 million gallons per day, that reliability will only drop to 98%. However, when we produce more water, uh, higher than 16 up to do the 25 million gallons per day, the reliability of the concentrate disposal dilution will drop to 75%. Like in the water supply area, this means that sometimes during the year, units three and four may be discharging less water and therefore less water 
will be available at the tunnels to provide the needed dilution, limiting then, therefore, the drinking water production at the desalination plant. The reliability of both water supply and concentrate disposal are the two main areas that will be addressed, and the goal is to maintain that reliability at 99% or higher. To the right are the options Tampa Bay Water has identified to address the impacted areas, and in the next set of slides, I will describe this. One option is a minor modification to our NPDES permit, and this option will benefit the concentrate discharge reliability. This is going to be done in con conjunction with the feasibility work that Mr. Ken Hurd will discuss later today in agenda item J1. This is an aerial view of Tico's tunnels outlets adjacent to the Manatee viewing area. As previously indicated, we are not currently connected to Tunnel 1. And the second option is a large capital project to connect directly to the Tunnel 1, therefore guaranteeing the 99% reliability for both supply and concentrate discharge. The project will include an outlet from Tunnel 1 connected to a new pump station and associated pipeline to our desalination intake pipe. The total capital cost is estimated at $13.5 million. We have to make the tunnel connection when it is offline, and the only opportunity to connect to Tunnel 1 is during TICO's Unit 1 construction when Tunnel 1 will be offline beginning the middle of 2021 through the middle of 2022. We are facing this capital project to take advantage of that window, and phase one will design will begin this winter to, read, to be ready to start construction in the middle of 2021. This phase will only include the new outlet, piping, and isolation valves to allow for the future connection to the new pump station to be completed later on in phase two. The capital cost for phase one is about $1.6 million. We already identified this project in our fiscal year 2020 capital improvements program. The second phase of the project can be constructed later on and once DECO is back online with Tunnel 1 and will include the new pump station and a pipeline to use the Tunnel 1 as a supply of seawater to the desalination plant. The total cost of this phase is the remaining budget of the overall project, which is $11.9 million and has an expected duration from beginning to end of 40 months. We're planning to add this uh, phase to the next CIP update for the fiscal year 2021 CIP in April next year. In summary, the desalination facility is co-located with Tico's Big Bend facility. Tico's modernization projects is on their way and will be complete in 2023. TICO's project impacts three aspects of the desalination facility operations, and we will implement a phase program to address two of them. We will pursue a minor, minor modification to the discharge permit, and we will complete a two-phase construction of a new tunnel connection. Madam Chair, uh, this concludes my presentation, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Are there any questions? Comments, um, Councilwoman Rice. Rice. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I just wanted to go back to the third slide, and I just want to understand again um, what's happening in the timeline with Unit One, Unit Three, and Unit Four. Sure. Um, <coughs> so currently, they let, let's go back. They have four units, and they're replacing Unit One. They're going from coal burning to a combined cycle unit. Um, that project is underway, and the construction, per se, of Unit 1 will take place when they will have the shutdown in Tunnel 1 will be from the middle of 2021 through the middle of 2022. Right. Um, during that pro timeline, they will still rely on Units 3 and 4 to, power, um, to provide power, and we will be able to capitalize and use the, the water as we are using it right now to supply our desalination facility. Uh, once they complete the project in January 23, what would happen is that Unit 2, which I'm not is removed from the drawing, will be totally offline. They will 
rely entirely and 100% of the time on unit one, which is their newer unit, mm -hmm. and then they will uh, continue to use number three on an as-needed basis, and unit four will be used 80% of the time. Yeah. Um, does that answer your question? Um, it does. I just want to, uh, in like going forward to slide six, I just want to understand how, what phased in options we want to take. Is there, is there a way to get better than the 75% reliability in 2023? Well, in 2023, uh, the 75% is if we don't do anything. Okay. So once we do the connection to Tunnel 1, we will go back to 99% reliability. And this is just change, uh, showing you what would happen if we do nothing at this point. Okay, that's what I wanted to clarify. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. Very thorough. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Uh, I two, three, and four will uh, all be presented by Mr. John Kennedy from Engineering Division. Morning, morning, Madam Chairman and members of the board. There's no uh, slides for I two. Just a verbal update. And we are working on a short-term and a long-term plan. And where we are on each of those is as follows: on the short-term plan. We committed to construct a booster station to increase distribution of existing permitted flows to meet growing demands in South County. And on that booster station, we're working, we've identified two parcels of interest. We are working on appraisals of those parcels. If we are able to conclude negotiations successfully, these would be a friendly acquisition. And we would be offering, hope to offer to you an option agreement for those one of those parcels at either your December or your February board. We are also entering the procurement process for an engineer for the pump station. And we intend to pursue an alternative delivery pro program for this. That's called frequently called design build. Uh, there's lots of flavors of design build, but the intention of design build is to deliver the project faster during the construction phase. And then finally, we've applied for Swift Mud co-funding. Keep your fingers crossed on that. Uh, we've applied for Swift Mud co-funding because this booster station would help us increase the distribution of alternative water supplies. On its side, the county uh, was operating in the mid-teens, the, the, the mid-teens of million gallons per day out of its central facility during the high demand days that, that you know we all experienced uh, well into October. And they were doing that, which helps them out and it helps us out. So that's where we are on the short-term plan. On the long-term plan, our public information group completed the public surveys. We got over 600 responses from the website uh, asking for comments on our corridor studies that we are looking at. And we have given those uh, results back to the engineers who will be wrapping up their corridor studies this winter, uh, this fall and winter. And once we've got those corridor studies, we'll be uh, working even closer with the county to uh, get a final decision on the location that they want to have for their new point of delivery. Uh, so again, what we're doing for that long-term plan is we're doing two things. We're setting in stage meeting demands now, but this is also going to be providing water for, from the uh, facilities that are under consideration in your master water plan. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. That's, that's my report. Okay, any questions? Don't see any questions. Thank you very much. That was I two, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we're on to three. Agenda item I-3 requests your, uh, your approval of a construction project. Uh, this is for the expansion of the regional surface water treatment plant high service pump station. And this facility <clears throat> was brought online in 2002. It has seven pumps in the building. Six are large, one is small. That small pump was there for the initial commissioning and was retired from service but still exists in the building. This project will replace that 700 horsepower unit with a new 2,000 horsepower unit to match the other six large units. The purpose of this project is to increase the annual average flow that we can provide primarily, in this case, to a new pipeline that we will build to South Hillsborough County. This project received Swift Mud co-funding in the amount of $1.2 million. We received five competitive bids for this project. They're listed in your agenda item. Staff recommends award of contract 2020-029 to PCL Contractors Incorporated, who is the lowest responsive responsible bidder in the amount of $2,168,480. That's our presentation. Be happy to answer your questions. 
Okay, we're now into questions on um, I-3. Any questions? Um, don't see any questions. Do I have a motion to approve? This, this is a good news story, by the way. Second, yes. Uh, we have a motion and a second on I-3. Is there a further discussion? One question. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm assuming, again, just, uh, you know, just uh, that all of this, all of these capital costs are being, are in our capital improvement program time frame. Yes, they are. They're, they're in the capital program that you considered at your June board. Thank you. And 1.2 from SWIFT MUD. Is considered as a net benefit in that program right. for the net funding requirement to be made up by this board. Is that in addition to the 2.1 or is that included? The 2.1 is, is uh, it, okay, the total project budget is about $2.6 million. I see. Including all costs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the construction is this amount that's in your agenda item today. And the SWIFT MUD co-funding is $1.2 million. Okay, very good. Thank you. So we do have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Like, sign, opposed. Show that pass. Thank you very much. I-4. Agenda item I-4 uh, is um, a, a project that we have to automate the additional bypass canal gates. And at the bypass canal, uh, just as a, a very brief introduction here, these are what the structures look like. These structures were built by the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, and Swift Mud Water Management District is the custodian and caretaker of the bypass canal structures plus its operation. And this project uh, proposes to add nine actuators at various uh, supply structures on the existing bypass canal structures. Project has received $516,000 in Swift Mud co-funding. On this project, only one bid was received for the project, and although the contractor did negotiate price reductions, uh, we were unable to get to a dollar amount that we could recommend to the board, and with only one bid, and that one bid being significantly over the program budget, st staff recommends the board reject the sole bid from Douglas and Higgins. Staff will work with Swift Mud on ideas including reaching out to South Mud contractors who work on gates uh, to see if we can get better results in a rebid or locate a piggyback contract that's already with a government agency in our state. If that staff recommends the board. The board has to take action on a public procurement, and in this case, we recommend that you reject the bid. Move to reject bid. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to reject the bid. Um, I just want to ask, why would we have only gotten one bidder? It's a very, very hot construction market. Uh, we had a significant amount of advertising. Uh, in the previous agenda item, which was also a mechanical mm -hmm. job, we have five bidders. In right. this job, it was, it's less attractive. And with the oh. private market being as hot as it is, we got one bidder. We, we have to gotcha. try again. OK, thank you. We have a motion and a second to reject the bid. All in favor say aye. 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 Like, sign, and pose. Show that pass. Thank you very much. And Mr. Jordan? Yes, ma'am. Uh, moving to J, Science and Technical, uh, Mr. Ken Hurd is going to uh, uh, present the Water Master Plan Feasibility Study recommendations. Good morning, Madam Chair, board members. Uh, this is an action item, so it's a three-part item, J1, A, B, and C. We are requesting board approval of negotiated contracts for J1, A, and B, and then a task order authorization under item J1, C. This is a follow-up to uh, on the feasibility studies for the Master Water Plan Alternative Water Supply Projects. Just as a reminder, back in December, the board approved the master water plan update. And that update covered these different topics or tools that we use in order to plan to meet your future water supply needs. The master water plan identified three top ranked projects that we would continue to evaluate as potential new water supply sources for the region. So with this presentation, again, we'll be asking for your approval to move forward with those feasibility studies. The driver for our schedule, in order to uh, meet the, the board's uh, and our member government's water supply needs, is really driven by our unequivocal obligation to meet your water supply needs under all conditions. So this chart represents our dry supply and dry demand conditions. And where this green line, which is our demand line, intersects the red line, our drought supply line, that 
targets our date or the year when we need to have new supply online, and that's 2028. So we we'll use this in order to determine what our water supply need is over our water uh, planning cycle, and that's over a 20-year period. And that's a 20 MGD need that we have uh, estimated for that period. Now, the one point I would like to make again on this is that we do update our forecasts on an annual basis. So we'll be coming back to you. Actually, we're coming back to you in December with our update for this year. But this is looked at every year, and we'll continue to evaluate and monitor this, along with the success of our demand management plan uh, as we move forward. So with your approval today of these future feasibility studies, we anticipate being able to complete those studies by the end of 2021. And then with a year of board deliberation, uh, we would anticipate the ability to select a project by the end of 2022, and that order for us to be able to bring that new supply online by 2028. So these are the three projects we're talking about today, the DSAL project, expansion, the regional surface water expansion opportunity, as well as new groundwater supply from the South Hillsborough Aquifer Recharge Project for the SHARP uh, reuse credits. Uh, starting off with the DSAL project, this is for item J1A. Uh, this scope is an overview of that DSAL project, and it looks at the opportunity to potentially expand this facility and achieve 10 to 15 million gallons per day of new supply. The study will consider uh, different aspects of that. Uh, some of those aspects were covered by Ms. Maribel, Maribel Medina just a few minutes ago. Uh, and so we're looking at alternative intake, uh, concentrate, discharge uh, feasibility. So we'll also be looking at doing some modeling of Tampa Bay to evaluate any changes in dilution ratios and what effect that may have and the permittability of those changes. And then we'll be looking at pilot testing of the new pretreatment processes that will be evaluated. And we'll be doing a condition assessment of critical existing equipment to see what uh, is the state of our current facility as we, need, as we estimate costs moving forward. So that'll be the final deliverable of this, is actually putting together all of these costs so that the board can have that information in order to make a responsible decision moving forward. Well, the DSAL project uh, is a contract that we're recommending that will be awarded to Black & Veatch. It is below the original estimate of $3 million. The contract that we're recommending is $2.9 million. The district is co-funding 50% of the project cost, so up to one and a half million. The district, or staff, is also requesting that the board authorize staff to uh, roll forward unencumbered funds from 2019 into 2020 budget, and that those funds would go into uh, the rate stabilization fund, and that we would utilize those funds to cover the costs of the project that would be ultimately paid for by the Water Management District. So once those district funds are in hand, then we would replenish the rate stabilization account. So we're going to request board authorization for that in, in addition to the contract for item J1A. On uh, the surface water expansion project on J1B, uh, the purpose of this project is to further assess the feasibility of expanding the existing uh, surface water system. We're looking at uh, the opportunity to actually maximize the available yield from our existing supply sources. The project will also look at the opportunity to potentially locate the new expansion quantity at a, a different location in the vicinity of the regional reservoir. The overall objective of this project, again, is to look at the feasibility, potentially get 10 to 15 million gallons per day of additional, additional supply. The project involves these different tasks. They're somewhat similar to the DSAL project and it looks at the impact of water quality on the source uh, water supplies. We'll look at the condition of existing uh, critical assets, the, 
capacity of our existing assets and opportunity to increase those uh, through the optimization process, where we'll look at how can we increase the reliability of our existing capacities in addition to looking at uh, expansion of the project. This contract is recommended with Hazen and Sawyer. It was negotiated at an amount of 695,000. This is over our original estimate of 550,000. And that's because the original estimate did not include evaluation of an alternative site for the expansion near the reservoir. And it also did not include a detailed evaluation of critical equipment uh, condition. I would like to point out that though, when you include the desal budget with the surface water uh, budget and combine those, since we were under budget on desal, we're about one, we're within 1% 1 of the overall estimate. So uh, in the, in, definitely in the ballpark of what we originally estimated these costs to be. And this project is also co-funded by the Southwest Florida Water Management District in the amount of $275,000. Moving on to uh, the item J1C portion, uh, this purpose of this project is to evaluate the feasibility of a new well field that would be realized from uh, reuse credits generated through the South Hillsboro Aquifer Recharge Project or the SHARP project. We'll be looking at the development of this new well field, uh, collection mains and additional water treatment that would be required to meet Exhibit D delivery to the county. The feasibility project includes a test production well, so we can go out and perform an aquifer performance test, uh, performing additional well field modeling, which would be needed for a water use permit application, doing a collector main layout, looking at water treatment requirements, and uh, then we would also need to finalize negotiations with Hillsborough County for the aquifer recharge credit. This work that we're talking about today would actually focus only on conducting the aquifer performance test that would be needed to determine the quantity of drinking water that we could actually produce as a result of the reuse credits through the injection. So this, this initial task that we're talking about would include the design construction man management services of a test well, the scope and fee for HSW service for this task has been negotiated in the amount of $291,495. Future tasks that will be brought back before the board include property acquisition of the test well and monitor well site. Uh, also, we'll be coming back to the board in the summer with a recommended bid for the uh, test well construction. And then back before you toward the end of 2020, with a contract for engineering services to complete feasibility work uh, that would be required to fully evaluate uh, the SHARP project. Madam Chair, uh, it is staff's recommendation that the board approve under J1A contract mm -hmm. with Black and Beach at 2.9 million. We'd also request on that item that you would approve the transfer of uh, rate stabilization funds or utilization during the year 2020. We'd also, and then under J1B, we were asking for board approval of contract with Hazen and Sawyer for the surface water feasibility study in the amount of 695,000. Or J1C, approved task order with HSW Engineering, support for the aquifer performance testing of the SHARP project in the amount of $291,495. Madam Chair, if it's the board's pleasure, you could uh, uh, consider these under one motion or however the board would like to move forward. I'd be happy to take any questions. So move. Second. Okay, so we do have a motion and a second. Um, I, I have some comments. I, I'll call on Commissioner Smith first and I'll make mine later. It has to do with the rates, the credits. Exactly. That's what my uh, comment was, just so that we're all clear that we have not reached consensus on the cost of the credits. Is that where um, you were going with that? And so I'm happy to support the moving forward on the feasibility study 
as long as everybody understands that that we uh, we are not uh, close to agreeing on the cost for the credits. And I was going to suggest, I don't know if we need a motion for this or just general policy, that um, this isn't really something, the cost of the credits isn't something just limited between Tampa Bay Water and Hillsborough County, that it's something we're going to need to um, probably agree on just in general for all the member governments. And so um, I, I think it would be a good idea for staff to work with all the member governments to come up with a, a price for credits that we could all agree on for reclaim water, not just in this one instance uh, for this one deal, but but for everybody moving forward in in kind of all situations. Might be some kind of a matrix of different kinds of situations or something, but but something we all agree on. Yes, Madam Chair, if I can address that, I would like to respond by saying that we have been doing exactly what you've said. We've developed a formula in working with the member governments that would enable us to move forward with a negotiation. And that was actually part of the memorandum of understanding that was under consideration for the SHARP project a while back. But that is something that we have in place, and we're certainly ready to sit down and go through that and work through you know, the different uh, elements of that formula so that we can arrive at what's a fair and reasonable credit amount. OK, so this has been going on for a couple of years, um, even <laughs> before you. And I, I th yes, Commissioner Smith is right on point. Um, and I, I, I feel very strong about this. Um, the negotiations between Tampa Bay Water and Hillsborough County on this credits, um, in my opinion, has not even been reasonable. Um, and I, th I, I'm not being negative about it, but I think it's the, um, the value of these credits are going to be more over time um, because of, of what is going on. So I, I don't mind uh, making a motion. I'd like to vote on these ones individually because on item C, I'd like to add um, something to that motion and I can pass the gavel that that formula be brought back to this board uh, for um, for our own study and evaluation um, and in discussion with our county governments to see if it is appropriate um, for our individual governments. Um, I do think that this is a much broader and it should not be limited to just negotiating between one government and staff. Um, I think there should be a policy um, going forward um, because um, I just, I, I feel like um, if we had accepted way back, uh, it would have really, I mean, the value would have increased over time, so you all would have made out so much better than we, we would have on the negotiation. And that's what, I just want to make sure there's a level playing field and that every member government realizes what's going into these discussions and negotiations going forward. Does that seem appropriate? Yes. Uh, Mayor? I, I can't speak to the maker, but it's the second. I would concur that we need to uh, talk about uh, the, the the credits issue on a, a multi-governmental basis. Uh, looking looking across the dais, I'm I'm seeing uh, Commissioner uh, Rice from St. Petersburg and Commissioner Oakley from uh, from Pasco County, and I can I can speak for Newport Ritchie. Uh, there's going to come a time when we're all going to be interested in uh, absolutely. This, this discussion regarding credits, because I, I really do believe this is the the way forward. So uh, whether whether or not we we put a a modification to the the motion to uh, just state point blank, we're going to talk about uh, this as a as a group as opposed to just uh, Hillsborough and Tampa Bay Water. Correct. I, that's fine. 
Okay. Um, who Why made that? You, you made the motion. My motion okay. for um, to approve. What is this? J. Um, it's J. A one A and B as they are, and on C, the wording you would like. Uh, on would, the negotiation of the credits, we can look at that. Would be on a multi-government um, approach yeah. going forward. Yes, I don't. I don't really have a problem with that. I've I've worked was with Mud. I was past chairman back in 2010, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we've talked about this sharp project ever since then. And I'm well aware of how it works. And I know you got to work out the numbers, and they got to be reasonable for all governments. So I'm, Absolutely, because really all. Each individual government here at this dais probably will have a situation at right. some point in okay. the future. I changed my motion to that. Okay. And the second agrees. Okay. Um, yes, Council Mr. Mormon Rice. I think the subject again uh, could be um, a proper subject for a workshop. Yes. Um, I'm not sure that all the member governments have all the same information at this point in time, and nor have we been privy to a lot of the discussions happening so forth. So it just makes sense to do this at a workshop. Right. Um, I think when they bring the information back on this, I think that's when and it may be after January. Um, so I do agree with you. So let's let them bring the information back and we'll go forward from there. If that's agreeable to everybody. Okay. So. We have um, the motions for J1 and JB as it stands, and JC with an amendment uh, language to it. Um, and we do have a second. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Like, sign, opposed, show that carried. <clears throat> and are you clear on the JC, the 1C? Yes, I understand language. that that has um, different language than J1A okay. and B, and I think staff will work on um, on that and, and bring something back for okay. the board's consideration. Okay, very good. Thank you. And then J2? Yes, J2 is the water quality update, and Mr. Ken Hurd, along with Andre Defendaller, Hazen, and Sawyer will be making this presentation. Morning again. Uh, item J2 is an overview of an update of Exhibit D water quality study that the agency, along with the member governments and Hazen and Sawyer, have been working on for the last uh, year or so. Uh, this item is a status update, so we're not asking for any board action today uh, regarding this item. And that's because we're still working with the member governments uh, on the final report and the recommendations associated with that. So we met with your staffs earlier this month where we introduced them to the draft report that was the, the initial or first draft of the report. And then your staff agreed to review that and provide their comments back to us by uh, the end of this week. Our goal is to bring this report, as we've talked about earlier, back to you in December for additional direction uh, as we move forward. So before I hand the presentation over to Mr. Diefenthaler, I'd like to provide you with an overview uh, of the Exhibit D and uh, just a general background on that. As you know, water quality was a key consideration in the development of the interlocal agreement and the master water supply contract. Through the interlocal agreement and the contract, the member governments established a common regional water quality. Goal was to provide a common benefit at a common cost at a defined delivery point or at all of the 21 delivery points. Through those contracts, Tampa Water is required to deliver uh, quality water to member governments at all points of connection. Quality water is defined as water that meets state and federal drinking water standards as well as additional parameters that are defined in Exhibit D, and that which is an attachment to the Master Water Supply Contract. We would also like to point out that the Master Water Supply Contract did contemplate that the Exhibit D may need to be revisited and modified from time to time to, in order to address changes that may occur in either in regulations 
or as a result of customer requirements or requests of the member governments. In fact, Exhibit D has been modified most recently. Uh, the significant change occurred in 2004, and after years of research on the utility's new water blend and member government's distribution systems. At that time, you may recall at Tampa Bay Water, we were the only utility in the country that was blending supply from three different sources of supply, from groundwater, fresh surface water, and desalinated seawater. So we had to understand how this new blend of water, what effect would that have on the member government distribution systems. So we actually used pipelines from the different member government systems and tested those at different blends of water, looking to create a stable water quality that would uh, well serve the member governments and their customers. In addition to that, EPA at that time was promulgating new limits for disinfection byproducts, and that applies to total trihalomethane and halocytic acid uh, constituents. In order to meet those stringent standards, those more stringent standards, uh, we changed our secondary disinfectant. So before that, we were using free chlorine as a, dis as a secondary disinfectant. We changed to a monochloramine or chlorine and ammonia as that secondary disinfectant. So the other point I'd like to make and make it very clear is that today our water quality meets or exceeds all of the state and local safe drinking water standards and it meets your Exhibit D requirements. So that's what this update is all about, is looking at the possibility of improving the quality of the water at the request of the member governments. Tampa Bay Water is reevaluating the Exhibit D standards to identify any possible opportunities that would improve the member's ability, essentially, to how to better manage the water quality in the distribution systems. So what could be used, to, for example, to help reduce flushing and reduce potentially any taste and odor complaints that you may receive. So at this time, unless there are any questions, Madam Chair, I'll turn the presentation over to Mr. Diefenthaler, and then I'll come back at the end and we'll talk about some of the next steps as we move forward from here. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you, Ken. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Let's start with which parameters do we need to look at as part of this review study that Ken mentioned. This discussion has been going on since 2017 with the member governments to look at the different parameters that need to be evaluated as part of the Exhibit D potential changes. 11 of the 17 parameters were requested to be reevaluated. This table shows nine of those parameters that we focused on as part of this study. The study did look at the required treatment and that might be required for these nine parameters. But we did focus mainly on total organic carbon. That's a naturally occurring compound within water supply. And it has a potential impacts on the formation. It does react with dis uh, uh, disinfections uh, to form disinfection byproducts. It also affects the stability of the residual. Um, it also can affect the flushing in your, in your distribution system. So that was the reason why we focused mainly on total organic carbon. We also did look at calcium hardness separately because that was a lower priority parameter that the member governments requested us to look at. And, and as you'll see later in the presentation, it could have a significant impact on cost. So we decided to break that out separately and not look at that together with some of the other parameters. To be able to evaluate these different uh, requirements and what might be uh, necessary to treat the different parameters, it is a multi-step process. Not only did we need to look at what is required for type of treatment and cost, but also what is the impact in the regional system as well as on the member government systems. For example, corrosion control. Any changes that you make within uh, the system and water quality could impact uh, something such as corrosion control. So it needs to be a multi-step process to be looked at. And this is the first phase that we're looking at, which is the water quality study we're talking about today. So the main goals of this study was to establish a framework for assessing treatment requirements, including planning level costs and benefits of additional treatment, 
for total organic carbon removal and other water quality parameters as previously referenced um, in the table previously. The overall approach was to develop a model to quantify optimum TOC removal, look at the benefits of blending, and the necessary water quality improvements at the various sources to achieve the desired water quality at each point of connection to different member governments. So why was a model necessary? Well, mainly because there's a lot of sources, individual wells, there's over 180 wells within Tampa Bay Water System, as well as the surface water and desalination uh, fa uh, facilities. Um, because of the limitations of the time within the study, we wanted to condense that data set so we can focus our efforts on a much smaller data set, which saved time as well as cost. And then we also wanted to look at the impacts of blending because we were looking at the water quality at each point of connection, we wanted the ability to adjust different levels and percents of contributions from different sources. So by developing a model, we were able to cost effectively look at how we could assess treatment that might be required um, and also account for different blending. Through this study and through the modeling effort, as well as this, the, the actual laboratory analysis that we conducted, we did observe the different um, benefits of different varying levels of TOC removal. On the far right of this, this slide is the goal of one milligram per liter of TOC that was requested by the member governments. But we did look at the sensitivity of other TOC levels to see how that can impact the um, the residual stability, as well as impact on disinfection byproduct formation. As expected, as we increase the removal of TOC to one, that level of benefit increases. When you combine the different levels of TOC removal with the other water quality parameters, this uh, graphic shows the additional benefits. Uh, the solid green circle is the most benefit that you can receive versus the quarter circle which basically just shows that as we continue to reduce the TOC level, as well as remove other water quality parameters, there is additional benefit to the member government systems. As part of the modeling effort and looking at the, again, looking through the study, to be able to achieve those different target TOC levels, we identified different locations that require treatment, as well as the extent of treatment at each of those locations. So in this table, for example, if the TOC reduction uh, goal was two milligrams per liter, there would be required treatment, additional treatment at eight different locations, and the TOC removal percent could range from 20 to 60%. However, if, additional, if one milligram per liter was the target, we would require treatment at 12 different locations. These would be like full well fields or service water plant, and the range of TOC removal could range from 40 to 85%, again, depending on the location. Yes. We have a question. Sure. Yes. Yeah, on that TLC removal, the wide range again. Could you explain why the the wide range of? You know, That's just a range because each location, um, each well field, for example, depending on the, what goal we're trying to achieve or what the original raw water source may be, the quality, there may be it may be a different uh, level of treatment that be required. So, for example, one well field might have a, a three milligram per liter of TOC in, in the raw water, versus another one may have five. So to get down to a level of two one will require a higher level of removal versus Still another. Still trying to get down to that level. Correct, yeah, so it just depends on what the original source quality was. It's this different level of treatment required. Thank you. Okay. So before I go into the preliminary estimates of costs for these different improvements, I wanted to highlight a couple of key assumptions. One is that these were class five estimates, which are planning level estimates, which means the cost could vary as much as minus 20% to more than 50% because these are preliminary numbers. We did apply different treatment technologies at different locations. We didn't just use one type of technology at one location. We looked at what was the level of treatment required, what type of parameters, and we looked at, for example, GAC at one location, which is granulated activated carbon, or ozone at a different location, depending on the need. For TOS removal, we did look at the average production of the well field um, for that removal. Um, compared to other parameters such as hydrogen sulfide or iron, we looked at the total production capacity of that well field or source water. So based on those preliminary assumptions, the capital cost, depending again on the TOC removal and the targets, uh, preliminary numbers could range from 126 million to 208 million, with an impact in uniform rate from about 22 cents to 44 cents per thousand gallon. And as I mentioned previously, we did look at calcium hardness removal separately. 
So if there was additional hardness removal required, it could increase costs from about 219 million to 301 million with an impact on the rates of 45 cents to 67 cents per million. Put that. Question. Yes. How do these costs here that you're talking about, maybe I'm missing it, um, relate back to those four scenarios that you were talking about? It, 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 that's why there's a range, Commissioner, so that the lower number would be based on a two milligram per liter of TOC versus the higher number will be based on a one milligram per liter TOC target. So the range is based on the range of TOC targets going from two to one. I just lost my stuff. Is that answer your question or? Um, I was trying to find my stuff while you, my okay. site on here while you were talking. So if you could uh, relate this to that other scenario again, please. To the four scenarios that we talked right here? about. Right yeah, there, yeah. Right there. So if you look at here, scenario A is targeting a, a TOC removal of to two milligrams per liter. The low number of locations are eight, locations that require that other treatment, meaning eight well fields, for example. Um, and the range of TOC removal can range from 20 to 60% removal to get two milligrams per liter at the point of connection. So that would be one cost. That would be the lower cost that I showed you. On the, one, on the high end, the one milligram per liter shows that we would have treatment required at 12 locations, and the range of removal could increase from 40 to 85%. So because it's more locations and your range of treatment increases to get to that higher, that lower TOC target, the cost will be higher. So the higher costs are based on the one at more facilities and a higher percent removal. That goes to that other chart. Correct, yes. You can right. go back to that now, please. Okay, Councilwoman Rice, she has a question. I had a yes. question about that. Yep, thing. sure, I can go back. Andre. Yes. Could you please clarify again what the number of sources is, are those wellheads or is that point of connection? Those are the actual sources. So it's, it's the, yes, it would be like an individual well field or it could be the serious water plant or it could be the desalination plant. So in this case, it's mostly the well fields or the actual source coming from the surface water plant that the target is to get at the point of connection. So the one is at the point of connection. So this is the required treatment at the individual sources to achieve that goal at the point of connection. So some points of connections have multiple sources feeding the same point of connection. Others may have one source treating that feeds the point of connection. So it could include well fields, but not necessarily. Correct. Yes. But most of these are well fields, yes, but yeah. And just out of curiosity, do we know why some well fields produce more TOCs than others? It's really just from the makeup of the, it's hard to say. I mean, a lot of it's just the hydrogeology and the location of the deformation itself. Like buildup of tannins. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of different reasons, yes. So. Can I just ask you, and you may not know this, but back in, I think it was 2006, when they did a water quality study like mm -hmm. this, they came up with a price tag of like $350 million to make it right, and then the... Tampa Bay Water Board just kind of kicked the can down the road till I guess us. And so did you go back to that study to see if anything had dramatically changed or was different than what you're talking about today? There, there are a couple of differences with this study that was done previously. Um, one is that we did account for blending where we did look at, because we're looking at the quality of the point of connection so we're taking advantage of, of well sources or other sources of water, such as the, the service water plant that might have a lower level of TOC, for example. So we're taking advantage of that and then blending at the point of connection to reduce how much treatment might be required at the different sources. So that's one, one area that was, what was different. And then also we're looking at the average flow from each well field as opposed to the max production of each well field. I see. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, great. You can continue. Okay. Thank you. So some preliminary conclusions based on what we've done to date, and as Ken previously mentioned, this has been reviewed by the member government, so we, we're still looking for feedback. Um, but from the study to date, um, it, we have seen that improving regional water quality uh, should help the member governments manage water quality in the distribution system by increasing residual, residual stability as well as reducing potential for taste and odor while decreasing flushing. Uh, the lower TOC levels will also reduce the disinfection byproduct formation, whether it was for chloramines or free chlorine. Um, it would also help uh, for, for member governments that you do free chlorine uh, maintenance events as part of the annual program 
it would help with minimizing the formation of bifrost during those events. Or if a member government decides to, to convert back to free chlorine in the future, the lower TOC levels will help with that. The other thing, the other part of the study that we observed is that the reduction in flushing, though that's a benefit, the cost savings associated with flushing does not by itself justify the additional costs of additional TOC removal. Um, it's, it does help, but it's not the, not doesn't justify it by itself. So part of the next steps that we're suggesting at this point, because we had a large data set that we condensed onto a smaller data set and we did develop a model, we are recommending that we collect additional water quality to basically truth the model and verify the model. Uh, also confirm uh, some of the assumptions with the member governments so we can refine the model. We are also suggesting that we do some additional bench and pilot testing, which would be on-site testing, to confirm the type of treatment that we're assuming at the different sources, as well as the different assumptions for level of treatment. So then we could use that data to basically confirm the capital and operating cost impacts. And then the last recommendation is that we could look at opportunities to phase this program and what are the benefits of how this program could be phased. So if there's no questions for me right now, I'll turn it back over to Ken. Okay, just one second. Yep. We do, and I have one. Anybody out down here? Okay. One question. Mm -hmm. We're back again back to that slide 12. Um, so, so the idea with um, these capital ranges, you're, you're also talking about it being a uniform rate ex increase as well. So you'd be paying with it from a capital source? That's the assumption for what we're showing here at this point, yes. Capital source pay, being paid for by the uh, increase in the uniform rate. Yeah, well, Christina, debt service, correct? Yes. Go ahead, Christina, do you want to speak to that? Please, somebody. I just want to make sure I'm clear on. <coughs> sure. The um, analysis that Hazen and Sawyer had in theirs was issuing full the full debt amount over 30 years at a 6%. Um, and then they divided it by the uh, 179 MGD and, and had equal payments. So once we get to the point that we would issue debt, we would look to see how much PAYGO we had that we could do it. And we would also um, not have necessarily equal annual payments every year. We would look at our debt structure to try and minimize the rate impact and take advantage of when we do have the rate drop. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just, I just have to ask you a question about the <clears throat> estimated completion date. Um, we're looking at seven years after 2021. I just want to let you all know. I mean, why is it taking so long? I mean, we've kind of known about this problem for a long time. I think I started talking about it in 2012. Um, because it kept coming to my attention. Why is it taking so long? I mean, people, that's why people get frustrated with government, <laughs> because everything takes so long. Yeah, I can walk through these action items quickly, and then Ken could speak. Do you want to speak to this? Or would you like me to speak to this, Ken? No, I, can, I can speak to it. Uh, you know, the one thing I just, Commissioner, on the, uh, the schedule, that's the purpose of this slide. So it may be helpful just to run through this so you give an idea of the requirement for the time that you mentioned. And certainly, you know, it is the board's prerogative to speed things up if they feel that's necessary. In this case, uh, we believe that assuming that we give some direction from the board to move forward with these additional studies by the end of this year or shortly thereafter, that would probably take about another year to a year and a half to complete those studies. You know, we're talking about spending a lot of public money in this case, and we believe that before we get you to a point and ask you to make a decision on spending hundreds of millions of dollars, we would prefer to make sure that we're going through all the due diligence, applying all the science, making sure that we're providing you with the best available information prior to making that decision. Now, when you look at the time that we're talking about, let's say that we take this year and a half to develop the additional information, go through the pilot studies, make sure we can identify exactly what TOC reduction can be achieved with different technologies, then we could come back, rerun our model, and provide 
information with much greater assurance in terms of the performance of the water quality improvements as well as the cost estimates involved to, in order to achieve those levels of TOC reduction. So we, then we would be looking at board considerations sometime around the end of 2021 uh, as to what would the board require us to do from that point forward. So what we did is we included, if you look at the schedule, we're saying that it could take anywhere from, say, two and a half to five years to design and construct these improvements. It just, that's how long it takes to implement these types of projects. So we would then, if once we went through the construction period, we would expect that the board would allow us to have like an, a year of full-scale operating under the new treatment facility operations to see exactly what TOC reductions we're able to achieve at the full scale. Because even with pilot testing, there's still uncertainty as how is that going to perform when you get to a full-scale implementation. So once we would get to that point, you'd be talking about a year of post-construction completion and commissioning operating period then we, would, we were just saying from that point, the board would then be able to consider whether or not they would uh, want to change the Exhibit D requirements. So I would just say that it's not a schedule where we're just taking too much time. I think it's just it takes time to build projects and to go through the, you know, the, the required deliberations leading up to those decisions. Okay, I, I just, I mean, we've known about these problems. I go back to the citizen engagement survey we did, Michelle did it, and I remember the one that stuck out to me is the people that used only bottled drinking water. I don't know if you remember that, Michelle. It was a very high percentage of people. And I'm thinking they're doing that because the water quality is bad and they don't want to drink out of the faucet. So... Um, you know, it's just, it's just a comment. I understand, but boy, I mean, to tell people, especially up in Northeast Hillsborough County where we have water quality issues, um, that it's going to be a while. I mean, we're not kicking the can down the road, but the can's just going to roll along slowly uh, until it's complete. Commissioner Eggers? Well, I just I, I I share your your thoughts and your frustration. I you know I I still get used have to get used to the the length of time to develop anything, and we're talking about you know all the way you know through our twenty in, deep into the twenty twenties before we have potentially the water quality that we're talking about. And boy, that's it, it. Just it is frustrating, and so I certainly don't want to slow down the process at all. Me either. In terms of getting to getting to that, so however we can look at that schedule and 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 tighten it up, um, the better. I mean, I, I just think we've got there's too many ramifications uh, for our residents, but also for our utility facilities um, that we need to address sooner rather than later. So and these positions on this board change. Um, we have elections, we have appointments, we have a lot of different issues. So. I mean, you get us all educated about it, and mm -hmm. then you've got a whole new group. Yeah. And I think that that's also kind of a negative. Um, if we could speed things up um, and keep our group kind of the same until you can get something to, to us in you know, 12 months or so, I think it would be very helpful. Yes, and just to make another point is that we are working very closely with your utility staffs, and we'll continue to do that and look for any opportunities that we can to expedite the process. But we will and have been and will continue to involve your staffs in this process so that we're kind of walking hand in hand as we go uh, down this road to uh, making potentially, you know, water quality improvements to the system. Okay. Councilwoman Bryce. Thank Mr. you, Chairwoman. Um, I appreciate that the, uh, and I can tell from reading the backup that there have been a number of meetings with utility directors 
But again, I just want to reaffirm, I think there's some really important policy decisions here that are under the aegis of the board. And especially when you're looking at um, projects that could, you know, um, cost as much as $300 million and require a significant uniform rate increase. So um, I don't think it would be slowing things down too much to have a workshop and uh, for the benefit of some of the new people on the board as well. And also just to fill in the blanks so that we all get a sense of what the different member governments are doing with our own timelines and what potential investments we may be making individually on our other side of the point of connection. We might decide, yeah, we need to speed this process up even more, or there may be benefits to not. But I, I just, I don't know, I don't have that information. Good point, good point. So the workshop list is growing. It, okay. It, it just. Oh, okay, Commissioner Smith was next, and now okay. I'll come back. Yeah, to you. Thank you. Um, and I think it's it's even more important to be trying to address this as quickly as possible because there's um, more and more public concern about uh, the contaminants of emerging concern, yeah. and and I don't know about you know removing reducing the total. Uh, car organic carbon, um, I don't even know if that will ad address some of the, the those concerns that are starting to emerge and uh, <clears throat> something could hit the newspaper that this certain pharmaceutical thing or the PFAS or something is uh, becomes a real hot button and, and we'll just be telling our constituents, well, we've got this plan for um, six or seven years from now. So, um, you know, I think we really want to look at how this is going to address some of those concerns so we can discuss that with our constituents as well. Right. Yes, absolutely. And that's one of the benefits of this program because the technologies that we're considering, for example, granular activated carbon, can be an effective uh, treatment technology that can remove these contaminants of emerging concern. So I think that we could be able to achieve what you're talking about as we move the program forward as well. I have a very congested roadway in South County, and these people thought it was going to be nine to ten years. I sat down with every government, and we got it down to five years. So we can do it. So get down to five years. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, I, you know, the only other comment I'd make is that as we, you know, we're looking at pretty far down the road here. Um, and so, again, as we start to get those capital numbers in line, and I do think um, we need to have that continuing dialogue about the pay, the, how, how long it's going to take to pay this off right. as part of our conversations that we're talking about having in the workshops. Those are those are important conversations. And I, for one, don't want to be one to kick the can down the road again. I think it's time to address it. Uh, but I think we all have some, some soul searching to do when it comes to that decision, because we're talking 10 years left at that point on the agreement with a 30-year bond that you were just <clears throat> discussing. So to keep the reasonableness of the rate. So all that plays together. So I think all that Absolutely. Okay. We are, that was just a status report, correct? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And J3 is the demand management uh, A and B. Uh, Mr. Ken Hurd, you want to present that as well? Yes, uh, item J3 is a report on the demand management and member converse, conservation update. This is split into two parts. Also, I got these multi-part items today. But J3A is just a general update on uh, the member government conservation efforts and how we've been reporting those efforts to you through your uh, board packets. Uh, this month, we reporting to you what conservation efforts have been realized in July and August. Uh, 
that information is included as part of your board packet. And then later on, I'll, this is just an information item, the J3A item, and when we get into J3B, we'll be discussing uh, the contract. But if I can, just uh, quickly walk you through how we go about monitoring the member government conservation efforts and collecting and reporting that data back to you in your board packet. We do that every two months. As I said, we're providing to you this month your July and August information. The report includes 27 different uh, metrics or criteria that we track, uh, such as things like the number of toilet rebates, uh, we also look at irrigation, the number of irrigation evaluations that occur, leak detections, water restriction enforcement. Uh, we also look at educational items like stakeholder, the number of stakeholder engagements that have occurred over the reporting period, and also new reclaim connections are reported. So a lot of these items are kind of educational. They're not that easy to define an exact quantifiable savings of water. We know that these are all good things to do and in order to save water. Our demand management program, on the other hand, is where we can actually identify things that we have a high degree of confidence that will be saving a specific quantity of water on. So we refer to those like active conservation measures. So we'll talk a little bit about those later under a J3B. So just to give you an update on where we've been over the past uh, couple months, we've been actively working with the member governments on various demand management efforts. For example, we've been meeting with your staff uh, individually uh, to determine how and through who will we be working through the uh, logistics of implementing this third party or the program uh, administrator to run the demand management program. We've been working through that, the logistics of that. We've also been working with other stakeholders through the process with University of Florida, Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, or IFAS, to create specs for installing and uh, irrigation devices uh, by irrigation contractors and evaluating uh, how those installations are actually working through the Florida Friendly Landscape Program. So we'll be working uh, kind of in an integrated fashion with the Florida Friendly Program as we work through this regional demand management program. We also began working with University of Florida in the development of a GIS application, and that can, will be used by the member governments and the program administrator uh, to identify where are these conservation savings occurring and help us track those as part of our annual updating. We'll be working with Florida Irrigation Society to survey irrigation contractors and determine if they can install a specific number of these uh, irrigation controllers as part of the regional demand management program. So we're trying to get out in front of the actual implementation of the program to give us an idea of what resources are available to implement these programs. Uh, and based on the feedback that we have received from the member governments, we are developing a bid document for uh, tracking toilet and urinal uh, inspections. And also, uh, that will be something that we'll use as we move forward with the regional program. So if there are any questions on that, I'll, I'll be happy to take them or I'll move right into J3B. Okay, I see no questions. Oh, oh yes, that's one member. Ken, can you give me an idea of what future like, different RFPs correlate to the different moving parts that are a part of this? Like what the board can expect? Well, we would plan to come back with, let's say, an RFP for doing for example, this toilet inspections. And let me just give you an ex kind of a put this in perspective, because right now we're talking about, if you look at the report, you'll see we do anywhere around 100 or so toilets per month total throughout the region. With this program, we're looking at accelerating that. So we'll be doing probably 500 a month. So a significant increase in the number of rebates or toilets, and 
So in order to do that, we're going to need to make sure before we issue rebates to make sure that those toilets are installed properly. So we'll be working with the member governments on an inspection program where we would identify a certain percentage of those to make sure that we validate that those uh, have been installed properly. But yeah, there, there will be some support services that we'll come back to the board with on this uh, that will enable uh, us to move forward with the program. Yes, my, my concern is, is just trying to keep track of costs so that um, I don't have it in front of me from our past presentations about this topic, but um, you know, it's a lot of money. So I'm just trying to get a sense of how we're not exceeding that budget with different contracts that are coming up that it's hard for me to keep track of if it's part of the original project or not. Yeah, we've included those as part of the original. Con if you look at the total budget over the 10-year period, we're looking at this program actually moving forward over or through 2030 and with the goal of saving up to 11 million gallons per day of water. Okay. which is the equivalent of a, wa a water supply project. So we're talking about spending, you know, $35 million total on this, and, and we certainly understand the concern, and we'll be reporting back to the board on the cost of the program, the cost effectiveness of the program. Uh, at the same time, you know, we're going to be looking at the cost of future alternative water supply projects that could be at equivalent of 11 MGD could be over $200 million. So, but I, I do understand your point, Council Member Rice, and we'll be watching the budget on this very closely and reporting that back. Uh, so that is something that we clearly will be keeping an eye on. Okay, thank you. You kind of stole my thunder. I'm moving into the next item. <laughs> this, anyway, I, I do appreciate your uh, questions. And that does lead us to agenda item 3B, which is the uh, staff's recommendation for board approval of the Regional Demand Management Program Administrator. I would like to take a, advantage of the opportunity to introduce to you uh, Bruce Matulich. He's with uh, EGIA, the recommended contractor before you today. Uh, they have done other projects like this. Uh, they're working on a project with uh, the Metropolitan Water District in California. Very similar program, actually a much larger program. Uh, we appreciate uh, Mr. Matulich being here today with us. So just a little background on the program. Back in August of last year, the board directed staff to move forward with the development of a regional demand management program, asked us to work with your utility staffs to develop an implementation strategy. So we've been doing that. Uh, they also, the board also asked that staff move forward with cooperative funding applications with the water management district, which we've done. We've submitted an application that Start, it actually went into effect uh, this month. And then we've also requested funding for the uh, next fiscal year for the program. Uh, we've been working with the member governments on the development of an implementation strategy. And through that, with the demand management working group that was established with the member governments, we developed this approach of using a third party program administrator to work with the member governments on the implementation of the program. And so this third party administrator would be used to directly work with and through the member governments in developing the different incentive uh, packages as well as marketing strategies throughout the Tampa Bay region. It is our intent to ensure that these programs work seamlessly through the member governments. Member governments are responsible for implementing these programs, and that is inconsistent. It is consistent with the interlocal agreement, and we that is the intent, and we definitely are moving forward with that understanding. In June, the board adopted our budget for this year, and that did include funds to begin program development uh, this fall. 
with actual programming or the uh, elements moving forward in probably the spring of this year. So we're on schedule to meet that expectation, assuming uh, you provide approval of the contract we're requesting today. We also provide an annual opt-out provision. So if a member of government elects not to participate in one year, they can. We're planning to come back to the board or to the member governments in April of next year or the following year to see who would like, to, if anyone would like to opt out of the program. It's up to the member governments, clearly, if they choose to do so. So what will the administrator be doing? They'll be coordinating and distributing, and tracking all incentives and rebates provided with and through the members, scheduling all field evaluations that we talked about, these inspections, for example, of the toilet uh, installations, and looking at other field evaluations or uh, installations of things like soil moisture sensors to help reduce outdoor irrigation water use. I develop and operate a website that will administer the 11 program elements and each member government will have a link into that website so you know if, you, if the customers, your utility customers will see that as a program by for example, if it's uh, Hillsborough County, it would be Hillsborough County WaterWise program. This uh, third party or program administrator will be kind of behind the scenes operating kind of all of the uh, integral operating parts of the program, but the member governments will be on the forefront with the implementation of the program. They'll be developing and implementing comprehensive full-scale marketing, promotional program, over the five-year life of the contract. They'll have a call and customer service operating center to respond to any questions that the public may have about the program. They'll also be able to track the program through databases. That, will be, that information will be made available to the member governments. We'll also be able to provide that sort of as a real-time update to the board. How's the program going? What conservation have we realized to that point? And then the other nice thing about the program is that every year you'll have the opportunity to reevaluate. We can look at the previous year. What can we do better? How can we improve the program? How can we make it work better for you, our member governments? So the selection process went this way. We set up a, uh, a request for proposals, but before we did that, we worked very closely with the member governments through the Demand Management Working Group to obtain their input. We included, also, we included uh, the Water Management District as a part of that group to get their input since they are providing half of the funding for the project. We developed a separate Sunshine-based selection committee made up of member government utility staff to actually do the evaluation of the uh, submitters of proposals for this work. We did receive uh, three proposals uh, that were timely. We ran the uh, advertisement for the RFP back in July. We received the proposals. This member government demand management working group evaluated the proposals in the Sunshine and unanimously are recommending the firm uh, Electric Gas Industries Association as the top ranked firm, and actually they were the lowest cost firm uh, to implement this work. So uh, if you look at the uh, process of moving forward, uh, we intend to today ask for your recommend or your approval of this contract with Electric Gas Industries Association as the highest ranked firm. We recommend award of this five-year contract in the amount of $2,320,894 be through the year 2020 through 2024. It's also anticipated that the district will be cooperatively funding this and as far as this contract goes we'd expect the district to fund uh, over a million dollars of the cost. So with that, I conclude the presentation and I'd be happy to take any questions and also uh, we have Mr. Matulak here if you have any questions for that, for the firm. Commissioner Eggers. 
Well, first of all, Ken, um, I, th I think this is awesome. Um, I think it's really exciting. Um, it's good to have uh, Swift Mud on board. Um, it's good that you have the ability to try to impact changes other than building more, more water uh, supply, which we're obviously going to do. Um, the water supply projects that we're talking about earlier, or I talked about earlier, we're going to be generating, what, what is the comparable that they would be generating um, each one, just roughly? Anywhere from 10 to 15 million gallons per day. And the cost was pretty significant. Uh, yeah, the cost would be, you know, over, I'd say in the ballpark of $200 million. And I, I you know, I'm not, I know you can't, as they say, save your way out of water issues and like that, but to me, this is significant and I, I, I just applaud the effort so far. I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I don't know how the, what the metrics are that show that we're being successful in this. I mean, I guess the, the rate of increase of water consumption mysteriously might be less. So we're, we will have to credit. Maybe the gentleman or the folks could speak a little bit to their ongoing administrative success that they've had and kind of maybe give some observations on that and just give us a sense of how that program works, how happy. long they've been doing that program. Do that. Thank you. Um, we've been administering water efficiency programs now for probably 15 years and overall uh, administering demand response and uh, resource efficiency programs for over 35 years. Uh, we currently administer the Metropolitan Water District program in Southern California, which is the largest and most complex water conservation program uh, in the country. And uh, over the past 11 years that we've administered that program, we've uh, processed or facilitated hundreds of thousands of rebate applications and actually have paid out uh, over $850 million to consumers, residential and business consumers uh, within uh, Southern California for their water efficiency projects. And to that end, when you do those efficiency projects, do you keep tabulations on, like you, you change a toilet, and obviously a toilet, a new toilet saves so many gallons per flush. Right. Do you estimate that, like, are we able to estimate through those programs the amount of water that's been saved yes. just by the programs that we've done? Yes, definitely. So we, we have a online you know, database uh, energy management system that when we set the program up, we program in certain savings parameters by measure that's based on kind of scientific evaluation that has been done. On, on those measures and uh, provide a, a dashboard that uh, Tampa Bay Water as well as the uh, participating member governments would have access to that actually can show you real-time information, literally real-time. An application is processed, it's approved, it would appear on your dashboard. And that enables you to track not only the activity on the program, but the water savings associated with the program literally in real time. And as you put these marketing dollars into the program and get folks aware of it in our region, is, did you, have you had any experience with um, how quickly they, folks get on board with it and how it maybe as time goes on, you get a, obviously a pers smaller and smaller percentage of people that are doing it, but all along you've been adding to the total. Is there a, a sense of that? Is it pretty front end, front end again? Yeah, I, I typically like to say that, that marketing is a marathon, not a sprint. Right. So it's something that you know, we would work with, with all the member governments and staff and develop a marketing communication strategy that, that works best for this region and, and for your organizations. Um, so it's, it's a consistent messaging, yeah. working with the utilities, uh, educating consumers, educating businesses. Um, and, you know, it's, yeah. it, it, it continues to evolve over, 
over time, but it's not one and done. Yeah. It's a continuous education process that needs to take place. Yeah, build it and they will come. In, in between, you got to tell them what you've built so that they will come. So that's my concern. But thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Councilwoman Memorize. Thanks, Chairwoman. Um, I see that you're headquartered in Sacramento. Yes. Do you have offices in the Tampa Bay area or in the state of Florida, or do you anticipate, how do you anticipate having a local so presence? So we're a, we're a national nonprofit organization, uh, and we do business all over the country. Uh, in this particular case, we've partnered with Big C Marketing in St. Petersburg as uh, kind of the local uh, feet on the street, so to speak, in that in that respect. Uh, in fact, I'll be meeting with them this afternoon and spending some time with them. But they uh, they will be responsible for uh, working with us and developing the local marketing communication strategy and working uh, with uh, all of the member governments. And. Part of the deliverables that you would deliver a, a plan and an inspection and an implementation program that would guarantee the 11 MGD in savings? Uh, that's, our, that's our intent, certainly, to build a plan and a evaluation process that would deliver that. And uh, is our understanding that the 11 MGD goal is based on all member governments participating? I believe so, the ones that are currently committed. All member governments? Okay. There we go. My name is Bruce I'm the Planning and Decision Support uh, Manager. So in terms of the quantity, I want to go back to answer those questions. Uh, once we have a billing level data, what we plan to do is every year to assess what actually happened. That's done in-house. Uh, so the 11 MGD assumes all the member governments are part of it. Interesting. Thank you. OK. Thank I'm you, sure. Andy. Uh, yes. I just want some clarity, because I started reading the last couple of lines here. And city of Tampa, as I read it, opt out for the year 2020. So you'll be doing all the member governments except the city of Tampa. <clears throat> for next year, that is true, or for this coming year. Now, what we're looking at, because the city opted out for this coming year, we can accelerate other programs that we're not... Yeah, I, I just wanted to record clean so we, that it's not all for all city, all governments. No, no, no. All right, I wanted that in the record that it's not for all government. We opt out. You opted out. Thank you very much. So that means we get a rebate of 6%? I don't know about that. Well, I mean, that question. you want to, you know, that's clarity, 6% one way and 6% the other is still 6%. Well, maybe it'll only be nine million of savings or nine million gallons a day of savings now instead of eleven. So I don't know. It'd be I nice, got it. It'd be Thank nice you. to get as much as we could. Great. Any further questions, Commissioner Smith? Yes, thanks. Um, so it's two point three ish million over five years, minus the one point oh four something from Swift Mud that Tampa Bay Water would have to. Um, pay over five years if we all stay in over the length of the contract? Well, th that would be the district's funding for just this contract amount. So they would provide additional funding to support the implementation of the other demand management measures. Mm -hmm. So this is just for the administration or the program administrator contract. The district will be providing funding above and beyond that for the remainder of the program. Thank you. And um, just wanted to know, does this include uh, a cash rebate program? Does the, the uh, cost include Yes, cash? there are certain, uh, certain components of this. Yeah, it's based on rebates. So uh -huh. once the uh, measure is implemented, then they will receive a cash uh, rebate. Mm -hmm. one, one of my first jobs was for people's gas, driving around, giving out um, checks for cash rebates for people getting um, on that system. It's, um, that's a fun job. <laughs> you know, say, maybe we can do it again. Um, and yeah. and uh, one last question. Does it also include printing costs and mailing costs of brochures and everything? Because it just that that stuff wasn't broken out, but just that's uh, that's a hefty expense there, can be. 
I just want to break it down. That's four hundred sixty-one thousand seven hundred one hundred sixty-eight thousand one hundred seventy-eight dollars and eighty cents a year. Okay. okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Don't see any. I do need a motion to approve. So moved. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve three B. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing Can I abstain since I'm not in it? That's a legal question, I guess. Probably good to vote for it. All members of the board. Are helping all your members. I've just asked a question. That's all. Um, there's, you know, when you abstain from something, there has to be a conflict of interest. And a bit, I'm learning this, you know, over my years with the state, um, you can't just not abstain for something like for that reason. So you need to vote. Um, okay, so we have a motion on the floor and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Like sign opposed. Show that passed. Okay, um, two more real quick items. Um, the under old business, the general manager's employment agreement, um, no one uh, uh, got back with uh, Roberta uh, about any changes. So, um, I guess the contract will stand as is. Um, my feelings were, I mean, I've never actually sat on a board where there wasn't a term for somebody's contract. Um, this is an open-ended contract. Now, obviously, we are an at-will employer in the state of Florida. Uh, but I just, you know, thought for his protection and for ours, um, I think there should have been a term, but if no one else um, echoes my uh, feelings on this, uh, we'll just leave it as is and go forward. Any other comment? Okay, then I need a motion to receive and file. So move. Second. We have a motion and a second to receive and file uh, reports. Um, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Like, sign, and post. Show that passed. And is there any further business before the board? Seeing none, we're adjourned.